it's time for the match preview and unfortunately we have to discuss the big derby game it's Luton Town versus Watford and with me as always to preview this game and always look on the bright side of life it's my co-host Mark Ryman <laughs> oh the Eeyore to your ticket um <laughs> yeah um well, look Make or break, isn't it? It's the very definition of it. So mm. let's hope it's a make. That is so true. Oh my god! It is. Yeah, like to summarise it, it is make or break. And we said it in our championship prediction video as well. Essentially, my thoughts on it is: if Luton cannot get up for this game, it's going to be a long hard season where we are most likely going to be battling relegation unless a managerial change happens because as it stands we're doing the same thing every single game we need to go back to the basics if we have any chance and for now a derby game is pretty much exactly what we need right now i think i hope yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, it it, it means that, that we, you know, points become the most important thing. The win becomes the most important thing. Philosophy can go out the window for, for at least 90 minutes here. I think we'll be up for it. I think we'll start well. My, my biggest concern is that, that will the pressure of Watford at home cause the same fragility in mentality that we've seen in our players and Rob, let's be honest, since the start of the season and we sort of implode and, and collapse as we've seen before. That That's my worry, um, which, you know, I think is everyone's concern, isn't it? That That's the, the worst fear is that that happens. Yeah, I, I disagree in the sense that the points aren't the most important thing. And I don't mind if we play a four at the back. I don't mind if we play a five at the back, seven at the back, one at the back. All I want to see is a team that's together, fighting, looks like they care, looks like they can string simple five-yard, ten-yard passes together, and defending as a unit essentially going back to what we were in the game in the 22-23 season when you know they turned up on the Harry Potter buses and we played them off the park and it was 2-0 yeah. and it could have been so much more than 2-0 yeah and arguably the 1-0 behind closed doors was it ended up 1-0 for me could have easily been a lot more than that as well mm -hmm. um I know what you're saying. I, I, I would ask this, though. Do you think a draw is good enough in this A game? draw is good enough if the performance is there, if the desire okay. is there, if the organisation is there. Because let's not be under any illusions. This Watford team are decent. Yeah. They are decent. Like, they brought back Musa Sizoko, who's, you know, he's 33. But as we've seen with Victor Moses, age is just a number. You know, you can be an elder statesman and still put in absolute bustling performances. And he has experience. He has ability. And I feel it's going to be the midfield where this game is won and lost. But considering how we've been at the back, it could also be a case of leaky defences is where this is lost. And that's why I say we have to be hmm. firm in this game have to be disciplined do yeah. the basics absolutely talking of defense um it could be an interesting one couldn't it in terms of the decisions made because mcginnis i think and mengi have had some concerns over fitness uh, in, during the international break too so that could throw the cat amongst the pigeons in terms of who starts too well uh, the latest from the island camp is that mcginnis should be fine for Watford. I think it was probably precautionary. Um, Mengi, look, we've seen Mengi go down like five times during a game. He just gets up and he's fine for the next game. Maybe there are some question marks about whether Mengi has indeed been yeah. on it this season, like the Plymouth game, perhaps, where, you know, it wasn't quite going his way. So he just sort of decided to go off. 
Yeah. Hashioka's training. I don't think Hashioka's the answer by any stretch. Like, as I said, I don't care if we play a back four or a back five. I just want there to be cohesion between the back whatever and the midfield. And I think in midfield, we need to play, you know, a double pivot with someone else in front of them. Um, like, I don't want to talk about systems. And, you know, Rob doesn't want to talk about systems either. You know, he, he sort of reverted to a 4-4-2 against Sheffield United to sort of shut everyone up. Or, or maybe it was a case of seeing if it would work. And it, it, it didn't. Um, it was probably one of the worst four four twos I've ever seen, but obviously that's punctuated by the players just being terrible and not stringing, doing the basics, string passes together and whatnot. Yeah, and, and playing out of position as well. I know. We, we oh yeah, I forgot, I forgot about Jordan Clark. As I a, mean, it's not. I mean, forward. Jordan Clark. I mean, Morris absolutely has to start this game, right? I mean, he has to start this game. You you would think um, if he's fit, which you'd hope he would be, but yeah, Jordan Clark out of position. But there, know, was Joe, there was Joe, Alfie and Joe Taylor well. and Brown yeah. both on oh, the bench. Exactly. So I I don't understand that thinking at all. No. Like going for an out of position Jordan Clark. No, no, me neither. Um, you were talking about basics for me as well. One thing that we've lacked all season, and this has been said as much as the formation is a leader. And if we need a leader, it's got to be for this game. Whether that means that, you know, we have someone um, start that wouldn't normally, like Capelli, for example. I'm not suggesting it happens, but something like that to get a leader onto that pitch in the absence of Tom Lockyer, whether that's Morris, as I've said already, that's fine too. But we need to have a leader on that pitch in this game. But you don't really need like a a, a defined leader on the pitch because cast your mind back, Lockyer wasn't the leader until, you know, Sonny Bradley was out the team, like falling out of favour. Like Lockyer was so out of favour at the beginning of the 22-23 season, yeah. there, there were talks about him going out on loan to Bristol Rovers just because he wanted to play football. And Lockyer only became our captain when Bradley was out the team. Bradley was still playing a fair bit of football. I think he played about 20 games that season. Um, but Lockyer took the responsibility. Lockyer stood up. And now it's time for other players on the team to stand up, to get their voices heard, to, you know, point fingers. I, I think Rhys Burke's done the, you know, he's he's actually made a good start of, of this, right? Because, you know, saying we need to go back to basics, we need to show fight and desire. If he can translate that onto the pitch, then we have a leader. But you need leaders in multiple positions yeah. and they've just got to be vocal really, because going back to that Oxford 2-2, when Oxford scored their seconds, there weren't any leaders. Um, Oxford scored and everyone head down, sort of trudging back to the halfway line. There, there was nothing. There was no fight. There was no belief. But leaders are forged in the fire of battle. And boy, it's going to be fiery on Saturday, isn't it? I hope so. That's what I mean. I hope so. And actually, look at the the, the fixture at, the, at our place last time. You talked about leaders. How many leaders were on that pitch that day? You know, as well. You know, and how much did it mean to the team? As we were talking about before, Osho obviously springs to mind to everybody after the red card at, at, at Vicarage Road. But I, it it just was a team together fighting for every single ball and. And Watford when just looked uninterested. Um, so yeah, exactly. I wouldn't say uninterested. They looked petrified. Yeah, okay. they they were terrified because the crowd as well. There were there were ten thousand leaders in in the. Jao Pedro the, was petrified. That's for sure. He was, and, and as was enough. Ryan Porteous. I remember the ball went out for a throw in, and Porteous yeah. was too scared to go over and get the ball from the fans. Yeah, it it was remarkable. We need it to be like that. Um, but I do fear, like, if Watford score first, what's going to happen in the stadium? Like, all the atmosphere is going to get <laughs> sucked out like that. Yeah, because the trepidation isn't in this, just in the squad. It's going to be in the stands. You know, we're, we're talking about not just a, a different 
team we're talking about a completely different set of circumstances compared to the last time that we played them um and you know they, they've certainly overperformed at the start of the season compared to where most people not just Luton fans most people had Watford even Watford fans had them towards the the, the lower end of the table um and, and you know we, we know our situation we don't have to go over that um so very different situation and as you said it it won't take much for that confidence to dissipate from the crowd as well as the team um we, as you said we we've got to be snapping into tackles we've got to make sure that we start the game right with high intensity you know not Liam Wolf style hopefully um but <laughs> <laughs> he's going to get referred to a lot isn't he until he starts to come back and put in a decent re- performance yeah. but well, we renamed an entire segment over him didn't yeah. we yeah, yeah, we certainly did. Um, uh, but yeah, I think I think it's it's got to be that you've got to get the crowd on side quickly. You know, you'd hope the atmosphere will be excellent in the start of kickoff. It will be. It's Watford, of course, it will be. You know, for people like us who started supporting Luton in the mid to late nineties, you know, we didn't, we haven't seen many Watford games. You know, for a start, there, there wasn't many in the early days. Um, you know, there were mostly draws that I can remember in those those nineties games, and then then we just didn't play each other apart from that cup game in two thousand and four two two thousand two two. Sorry, the Worthington's Cup game that Spring scored in. You know, that that was it until we're back in the championship, right? So uh, in the uh, in the early two thousands, and then again recently. So yeah, we'll be up for it, but we need to see some fight, definitely. I'm delighted you completely skirted past that 4-0 game. I'm not uh, talking in, about in that. In 97. That did not happen, <laughs> mate. I, I'd, I mean, I was, yeah, I was 11 um, at the time. So, yeah, fully fully now into to Luton Town. I was a Norwich, I, I was born in Norwich, so initially a Norwich supporter. And my, my dad was having none of it. I was a Luton supporter. And within a year, that game happened. Um, <laughs> we, we don't talk about that game. We do not talk about that game. Well, we're going to talk about that game right now because that was two teams (laughs) on completely different trajectories. Obviously, they'd just been been taken over by Elson John and Graham Taylor was back. So they went, they were going Mm. upwards. We were sort of going on our slow decline down to what is now known as League Two before we shot up to the championship where we played them, um, you know, that season. And obviously there was that fantastic Berkovic goal yeah. um and then you know they went that way we went that way and you know obviously our paths have crossed again and then we went that way they were sort of meandered mid-table and I, I felt this was the the reason why I'm so frustrated and worried is because this was the first fixture I looked for in yeah. the when the fixtures were released, the, this was what I looked for. You know, Watford at home at Kenilworth Road, and I was thinking, yeah, because when the fixtures were released, I wasn't as obviously I've been talking about it all season on my instant post match reactions, where I've said something's not right with this system, something has to change. At that time, I was really optimistic and I thought we were going to attack the championship with so much might and it's all gone a bit Pete Tong. Mm. So now I'm really worried, but we should talk about our predictions because we've actually both predicted wins. Yeah, (laughs) it's against my religion to back Watford to beat Luton, I'm afraid. So (laughs) um, for, for that reason, I've predicted a win. I predicted a win on hope. I've said this in our in our last podcast that we did our championship predictions. I've I've, I've based it on hope. I, I think there's a there's a real symmetry, isn't there, of the next two fixtures? I mentioned it previously that we've got Watford at home, followed by Sunderland midweek. The two the two defining games, the two games that we'll probably remember the most, apart from that final in the in that season, the season before last. Um, both of which had the, the best atmosphere I think I've ever been part of at Kenilworth Road since I've been there. I mean, Sunderland was unreal. You couldn't hear yourself think. Um, what, I thought the ground was Watford. shaking. Yeah, it was. The ground was. was shaking at Sunderland. It was crazy. So it's a sort of mirror of that. And of course, we had Rob in charge of both of those games as well. So it's he'll be acutely aware of this as well. And it's the hope that it, it, it can go one of two ways, clearly. 
you know, we've talked about our fears about the, the one way it can go, but it can also spur him on. Because for me, the whole thing rests on his mentality um, and his confidence in himself. Um, and if this can spur his confidence, then then I can see us getting two good results. Um, so that's where my three nil has come from out of that hope more than anything else. Yeah, so I've, I've gone two nil. And purely based on the fact that I feel this is a game where they just have to get up for it. And we have so many people around the club who have been part of the furniture for so long, like on the playing staff, Pelly, who's been there for 10 years. Um, sure, he's only played in a handful of these derbies, but he knows what it's about. And then you've got the board, who are all diehard Luton fans. They hopefully have communicated it to the players. Rob Edwards himself, who has... He's only the second manager to have gone from Watford to Luton. And Mick... Hopefully Mick's getting in the ears and he, he's managed us before many times. He's coached us before many times. So hopefully he's down the training grounds and overseeing things because currently the way it's going with Rob Edwards and you, you, you hit the nail on the head where, where you said, you know, he needs to up his self-belief. As a football manager, you need to be strong mentally. And I'm not I'm not diminishing anyone's mental health battles. I have my mental health battles. I'm sure you have your mental health battles. Rob Edwards is clearly having a mental health battle, but he's wearing it on his sleeve and showing it to everyone. You think Neil Warnock in his 40 years of management hasn't had hard times? No, of course he has. But he's always had this gritty happy-go-lucky facades and you know he's managed teams in relegation battles he, he's led promotion charges he's always always got the same outlook at least in public whatever he's doing you know complaining to his wife about you know that obviously stays at home it never is seen on the touchline ever and rob edwards is just it's like playing poker right now with your cards out. Mm. You know, he's just showing everyone yeah. his hand. And he's he's got to, you know, if, essentially, if there is a negative result and the crowd boo, you, you can see it affects him so much because he obviously cares so much. But he's got yeah. to snap out of that. Yeah. Because you're a football manager at the end of the day. He's probably the, the highest paid person at that club. So he's got to turn it around because ultimately, not to diminish mental health, a misery guts as manager isn't going to be able to elicit that reaction from the players that we need right now going into this game. Yeah, I mean, you, you were talking about you know managers that have, have been there and done it over the years, you, you people like Neil Warnock. And, you know, they're their way of of expressing themselves on the touchline would be to, you know, I mean, Warnock was brilliant at doing it, you know, just basically turning all of his anger onto the fourth official or etc. Like fourth officials like would draw straws whenever they knew they were playing a Warnock side because they didn't want to be anywhere near him. But I mean, and Nathan Jones to an extent was like that. And I think it's one of the reasons why people, you know, we're talking about Nathan Jones because he has that side to him. And, and whereas Rob, his his greatest strength, his empathy is also his greatest weakness at times like this. And he just, he, he, looks at, he looked at a, a beaten man a fair few times and I want him to be angry. Uh, you know, I really do want to see that, that frustration and anger. You know, he was, you know, probably a, a little bit more vocal on the touchline over the last two games. It was good to see him standing up and shouting at players, although... Yeah, like you said, you need to see that first from him. If you expect it from the players, it has got to come from the manager first. And he needs to have that self-belief. I mean, the look, the Luton fans clearly believe in him. I think that's part of the problem as well, you know. I think that he feels like he is letting down the fans that have backed him throughout the Premier League. There aren't, you know, I don't want to keep harking on about the lapse of honour and everything else, but, that you know, every result, including the, the Fulham game at the end of the season, 
players were applauded and rightly so for, for what they, they did for the club, for some of us showing us that, that the best times in living memory. But I think that all of that means that he felt he then owed the fans a promotion. That's a very dangerous way to look at how to go about a season. And I, you know, I, I might be wrong, but it feels a bit like actually that the, the more, in a weird way, the more the fans backed him last season and this season, then the more pressure it, it puts on himself as well. Now, I'm not suggesting, by the way, or advocating that, that, that people do. That's up to you if you want to. But I, I feel like that, that might be some of, some of the reason for that pressure too. Yeah, he, that that is the thing. He, he, it sounds like he's overthought it. And some mm. people say, some people might say, it's not that deep, mate. Well, it is that deep mm. because obviously Rob Edwards is so in his head. And he's obviously dwelled on this so much. And yeah. he's got to, he's got to get himself out of this funk. Like, yes, he can, he can have a mental health crisis, but at the same time, it, you know, he, he can do that privately. Like, I, I, I don't know the right way of saying it, really. Um, I, I guess the best thing is that, look, if he, if he is and, and he should have, have the support network around him and hopefully that he does and we all hope that he's OK as a person um, regardless. But often the only answer to that, if that is the case, we don't know it is, is that he needs a break. That that is, that he needs a break. You cannot necessarily in a week's international break, if that is the reason, if he is really struggling with his mental health. I, I don't know whether a week's international break is going to do the, do the job. I think he would need a break away from football. Well, th but, there you go. Yeah, you you've helped me find my words there. When mm. I said in private, I mean he needs some privacy. Yeah, in that sense, like being sort of the, the 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 face of a team is not ideal when you've got to go face the media mm. pre-game post-game and then you have a, a tv camera shoved in your face as well it's it's not ideal and there were rumors last week that rob edwards handed in his notice and if that's the case and he needs to take a break whether it's for his mental health or because he feels he's letting the side down that is affecting his mental health Gary Sweet has a duty of care to Rob Edwards as his line manager or, you know, person of responsibility to accept that resignation. And whether or not that was a rumor, you can see he's clearly struggling. And um, whether or not he hands it in his notice, it's, you know, it, it's something that does need to be taken seriously uh, by Gary, by the boards. And, you know, whether it's a case of, oh, yeah, we, you know, we can't accept it because there's no one else on the free agent market or because Mick doesn't want to take it because of his health. Mm. Essentially, sometimes you need to consider the human and, and take it seriously and, and maybe get someone else in like a Benson or, you know, a Lawless, anyone just, install someone you know just to give rob that break because i am i'm so concerned going back to the game a bad result or a bad performance and i don't know if he'll be able to emotionally take what the crowd dish out i think most people have said that a poor result at, by, against watford and by that we mean you know a loss without that fight a loss regardless against Watford. I'm sorry that, that that's still, that's still going to be difficult for him. Um, and th that could well spell the beginning of the end um, f for Rob, because, you know, as you've already alluded to the board, are fans of the club, you know, this means a lot to them as much as it does to us, this fixture as well. And it's not as if we've got an easy run coming afterwards. Um, it's probably the toughest run you could have, Um or asked for in this period, right? Um, so, yeah, it, it's it, as we said, it is very much make or break. And I, I really hope to see um, in the in the press mat in the presser before the match on on Thursday or Friday, whenever it is, um, a bit more of the Rob Edwards of of last season um, in terms of 
his positivity going into the game. Um, and, and hopefully we see it on the pitch and we see a group of players fighting for him as well, because that's the key too. They must know that he's under pressure. Um, and if they're, they're still behind him, you know, which all reports suggest that they, that they are, then they need to fight for him because that then, you know, if they don't, it, it, it is, it's, it's sooner rather than later. It's got to be if, if there's a poor result, I really do think that. Yeah. And I guess we should yeah. wrap this up. <laughs> We're delaying the inevitable. Ah, but Hatters, if you're watching this and you love Luton Town content and you're not subscribed, why not like this video and subscribe for even more Luton Town content? And I guess we go on to Watford at home. Let's be having it. As Come always. on, you hatters. Come on, you hatters. Come on.